Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to a very special episode of the show with a all-star cast. Let me introduce the cast first, and then we'll start talking about what we're going to talk about. We've got Brendan Snyder here. How's it going, guys? From the Ooh. corner, Mr. Scott Lade. Hey! And from Grant's Rock <laughs> Warehouse and the Contrarians, Grant Arthur. Hey, nice to be here. Nice to see everybody. Gentlemen, be familiar faces to everybody where you've, you've seen them on here on Sea of Tranquility or on their own channels. Uh, lots of experience talking about music with the four people sitting in this uh, Zoom call here. And I brought them here for a reason. Uh, I've long been wanting to do an episode talking about a handful of bands that people, I think, have a hard time classifying them. They put them here. They put them there. They don't belong here. They don't belong there. What are they? Those bands are 10CC, Supertramp, Roxy Music, XTC, and ELO. Are they prog? Are they pop? Are they art rock? What are they? We're going to try and find out today. <laughs> We're going to try. I must and... say, that's why I'm here, because I really do need to find out. Yeah. yeah okay. okay. I think we all do, right? We all need to try and figure this out. First, you know, before we kind of get started, um, I guess... When was the first time where you guys kind of came upon these bands? And do you like all these bands? Uh, and maybe how do you think of them? Brendan, I'll have you start. Like, right. what's your first experience of diving into this type of music? Because a lot of the, these yeah. bands are a little bit different than maybe some of the other bands that we all talk about on our channels all the time, right? I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I didn't um, get into these maybe the traditional way through a hit hearing it on the radio that sort of stuff so like um elo interestingly i got in through ace freely because he does a cover of the song do oh. you on here and i loved it until of course i found out it was not his song and that bummed me out that it wasn't ace freely but i said i gotta go find elo and what is that sort of stuff? Wasn't even ELO's song, really. It was the move. Right? It was the move. move. Yeah, exactly. well, <laughs> there you go. See, I'm learning something on that. But that that was my lead into it. The other thing being, um, I'd known the name Jeff Lynn through the production that he did with Tom Petty on albums that I happened to love. So there was that. And of course, him being involved in the traveling Wilburys. So I found ELO in sort of a backdoor way. Once hearing them, I said, oh, I, I do actually know some of this stuff. But it wasn't stuff that was being played on traditional radio format, which kind of may lead into that thing of what are they? You know, they're not necessarily classified as pop music or hard rock or rock or even prog or whatever. So radio stations don't necessarily know where to put them, or at least back in the day when DJs could actually pick what they were playing. Um, so that's kind of how I came into um, ELO at least. And the rest of them are all kind of the same way where I, I came into them in a backdoor sort of way. Um, you know, Roxy Music, Simply just based on the Country Life album cover as a young boy, I said, what is that? I've got to check it out, right? Great marketing on their part. What uh, is that foliage? I'm really interested in horticulture. Oh, absolutely. That's well, what you were know, interested in. Some of the album covers, uh, because they were censored, all it was was the bush. I think it was this cover. They made yeah. that the front cover of it. So yeah. maybe there is somebody who is into horticulture <laughs> getting into it. But I got this one and it was good and I kind of enjoyed it, but it wasn't until later on getting into uh, Flesh and Blood where I actually really clicked with the music and said, hmm. this I like, you know, and we're, we'll get into it maybe, you know, later on in this, but that's where earlier stuff from Roxy Music, I classify in the art rock. It was not pop or uh, traditional stuff that I would have expected it to be. And I, I couldn't enjoy that. I've now since gotten into it, but it was the later stuff that I said, oh, yeah, I, I can I can get into this. I know this, you know, as my tastes have changed over 35 years and grown and developed, I've gone back in a lot of these bands and explored the other parts of their catalogs. And just real quick, you mentioned two bands right there, Brandon, ELO. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Roxy, both of whom had you know, real distinct periods, you know, their mm -hmm. early stuff uh doesn't sound anything like avalon you know so going yeah. back is actually something you do when you get older and you mature and you, right. you realize maybe you don't know everything and you go back and listen to those records like wow maybe i did miss something roxy music never put a bad record out 
by no, the way. not at all. I just want to put that out there. Everything well, you, is amazing. You mentioned a band that never put out a bad record. XTC never put out a bad record. And also, if you listen to the first, you listen to white music and then listen to Apple Venus, mm-hmm. holy crap, it's yeah. uh, two different animals. Yeah. And I think, well, I've said this. We just did a show on the Contrarians about it, and Martin didn't agree, mm-hmm. but that's okay. I would have to say that I don't think X, I think they always got better, is what I think. Though some people like different periods, but I think XTC is one of those bands that just got better. I think Apple Venus is absolutely it is the brilliant. Only, the only reason I would disagree with you is Wasp Star hmm. lost a little bit of its magic. You lose Dave Gregory, you lose a big piece to the XTC puzzle. Wasp Star was surprisingly good, it wasn't as good as Apple Venus or none such. Well, or- I, I think Dave was a secret weapon because once Dave came on there with drums and wires everything clicked because drums and wires is absolutely brilliant perfect and but how would you classify apple venus and how would you classify white music you know obviously back then they were post-punk yeah mm-hmm. and they went through different periods you know so it, a like, lot of like, these bands are eh, it's well, gonna be hard. how do you classify fire band do you do it based on what they started out as do you do it when they became the most popular where people know what it is or in some cases what they evolved into? And I always look at Asia, who is a bunch of prog guys getting together. But those early albums were just pop, in my opinion. Later on, after the first three that they did, when they continued on, they became a real prog band and, you know, developed that way. But that wasn't what they started as. Or or the other way around. You know, I'd, I'd hate to be the one classifying bands at prog archives because what do you do with you know certain bands you know that utopia started out as a very progressive band turned into a pop band genesis is probably the easiest example (laughs) right you know so it is it is rough to classify and the bands we're talking about today are particularly rough to classify because a they did change their sound a whole bunch but they were always operating in this weird world where uh they defied categorization right from the get-go and uh, ELO is a perfect example. I mean, how many bands had a lead cello player? I mean, come on. That's, <laughs> not not it's, many. It's, I mean, these just, two albums don't, it couldn't man. sound any more different than the rest of the catalog, yeah. right? Because I this, love them. Of course, this, this is, you know, basically the move with a different name and this weird blending of pop, rock, and classical music. And then once Roy Wood jumps yeah. the sheet, uh, Royal ba- Roy bailed after the first album, so it totally changed with ELO too. Yeah, and then, you know, Jeff, we know Jeff is a huge Beatles fan, right? So all yeah. of a sudden, let's incorporate yeah. some of that kind of classical stuff that was going on in the first album there with his love for the Beatles style pop and rock, and then all of a sudden, you've got a completely different beast, and they would go and change even more, right? Because I mean, the first album I ever bought from this band was this. Mm. Me, oh, this yeah. That's absolutely fantastic. Yep. That was it. That was the first one for me. But this doesn't sound anything like those first two or no. three albums at all. No. Right. I all would say sudden, that that's that has to be a pop album, don't you think? That, that, there's pop on here, there's rock on here, there's disco on here a little bit, right? There's right, right. kind of symphonic rock on here, you know. That's then, where I kind of like uh this one right here, line, though, right? It kind of splits the difference. I don't think there's any yeah. prog. You feel a little bit of the old yeah. move, and yeah. uh, definitely there are some hits on here. You know, this is more of a pop-oriented record, but this right. to me is right the sweet spot for ELO, and uh, probably where I point people to if they're on the fence about whether or not ELO has any prog in them. You know, well, El Dorado is a good place to start. I was yeah. just going to say because I think that's what Brendan was was bringing up before. So, what for all the people who say, "Well, ELO is a prog band," what makes them prog? Yeah. yeah. The complexity and the instrumentation I get and the fact that they incorporate orchestration into it already elevates it into a completely different level. So I can understand people calling it prog, but I don't think it's prog at all. I I don't think it's prog either. They Uh, continued on from where the Beatles left off with I'm the Walrus. That was the idea. What would you say I'm the Walrus is? Is that the birth of prog? Not necessarily, but oh, but a lot of times, but I think the Beatles, elements, were, I think it was the birth, you know, yeah, yeah. there's definitely elements of it, 
And like you said, ELO just kind of continued what the Beatles were doing. So if right. the Beatles had elements of prog in them, then you know, by transference, so did ELO. So I'm right. comfortable with saying they're a I mean, prog adjacent band. Prog adjacent. <laughs> there you, go. There like you go. We have a new way to categorize. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and I think too, for a lot of people, you know, you got a guy like Richard Tandy in ELO who plays yeah. like a million different kind of keyboards. He's playing the Moog and the Mellotron, the yeah. electric piano, the Hammond organ. You name it, he's playing it. And it's like, well, if it's keyboard heavy music with lots of layers, it's kind of prog, right? With the classical inspired the uh, back and yeah. the violins and all that yep. stuff. Yeah, so I guess. There's, but right. there's no odd time signatures no. with an ELO. It's very straightforward. And yeah. For me, that's one of the defining features of what makes something prog. Yeah. You, you know, that's why I said Asia was not, uh, you know, they're a pop band. They're, they're not prog. It may have been prog guys coming in, but they weren't doing those odd time signatures and those long jams and things that, in my opinion, define what makes something prog. So they just weeded all that stuff out and wrote killer songs. And I, and I feel like that's what ELO did. You know, they, they could have been a full on prog band, but they weeded all that stuff out and said, you know, we're just going to give you the the digestible parts. Yeah, that's not what the label was looking for in 1981. Uh they didn't want a band doing sidelong sweeps. They wanted a band that could, uh, you know, move the needle at, at radio and at retail. And, uh, hey, it worked, man. Uh, you know, the number one selling album of 1982 was not Thriller. No. No, because no. it came out in November. Uh, <laughs> the number one selling album of 1982 Ooh. was Asia. You yeah. Know, so they obviously had the right formula. And they too, you know, they're pro there's little elements of prog mixed yeah. in, even on those first two albums. Uh, but not not prog. But prog. those records, those records when John Wetton came back, like you mentioned, or those are the records you are you talking about the other ones? No, uh, the, the John, became prog. Yeah. John Wetton left when John Payne came in. John yeah. Payne. Yeah. The but one those Wetton Payne. albums. Yeah. When he came back. Yeah, yeah. So those were were, were much better. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the John Payne era albums are very, very different. They're more like just kind of like um, maybe a little lighter version of like Deep Purple or something like that. They're kind of mm -hmm. these very keyboard heavy, uh, very melodic, but not overly commercial albums. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. They're weird. I, I actually really, really like them. I hated them back in the day, but they're they're actually really good. And and those they don't sound albums. anything like Asia. They really don't. No, they don't. They really should add a different name. But and I love yeah. that era. I love both eras. But I don't even consider them the same band. Yeah, it's like it's, well, it's just Jeff Downs and a bunch of people. Yeah, yeah. that always constantly change. <laughs> yeah. Well, that I must say, I know we're on a tangent. Yeah. Who saw Yes? And Asia and Arthur Brown, that tour from a couple the of years Royal, ago. The Royal Affair. Wow. I must say when Asia played and Steve Howe was up there and Bumblefoot was there, I thought they were, ab it sounded exactly. I was sitting there going, oh my God, they pulled really? it off. It. I couldn't you believe Didn't you think Bumblefoot was absolutely insane. wonderful? He sounded he like great. They were my favorite band of that bill. They were, wow. they were great. It exciting. sounded like 1982. I, yeah, I saw the videos and was blown away by it, but it was just like, how did they make that selection? Why would they go to him? Yeah, he was great. Yeah, perfect. That's what I know. <laughs> yeah, Crazy. very strange. Yeah. It worked. It worked. Yeah, it worked. All right. So, how about Super Tramp? So, yeah. Super Tramp is an interesting band because they released those first two albums, which are you know very different, and I would say both of these are fairly much british early prog right mm -hmm. and then they come out with what i consider a prog album is this this is their right. masterpiece mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. they kind of like move away from it right they kind of yeah. decide right. to become more of a straight ahead pop band and although you know there's moments of prog rock on some of these albums for sure you know like this has got got its moments mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but then this is not a prog album this no. is not a no. Great pop no but it's a great record it is right yeah. and that's the one i came in on so for me a lot of times it's what's the most popular thing what does the the general public when they think of a band what do they think of they think of that era they think of those hits on there and those people would never think prog yeah it doesn't mean that they're not it's just to me what is the most defining element of the band and sometimes that is the successful aspect of them 
And I tend to categorize and classify bands based on that as opposed to where they started. And for me, it's like um, completely left field, different uh, genre of music here. But Def Leppard, who was new wave of British heavy metal and basically started as a metal band. But with Hysteria, they became a glam metal band. Yeah. And for me, that's what they are. They will always be a glam metal band, even though they're actually new wave of British heavy metal. They grew out of it. And Guns N' Roses is another one of those who was a glam metal band when they started, but grew so big and outside of that to just a straight ahead hard rock big band. That's all anyone knows them for. Yeah, that's a good point. And some of these bands did the same thing. I think, you know, by the time that Roxy Music you know, left what I consider their earlier stuff being the art rock, the more experimental stuff that they were doing, whether prog or not. And they moved into, and ultimately with Avalon, it's just really good pop music. Yeah, it started and, here with the uh, with yeah. the hit, their first hit, That Love is a Drug. Man, yeah, that sounded that. so good on the radio, but well, it still it, kind it, of sounded like Roxy. But it's right. disco too. And that's that's like, the only it, song on there that sounds like that. Yeah. yeah. So it's like they they did that. But again, that was popular music of the day. So yeah. when we're talking about pop. I mean, it can cover a lot of different things. And they moved with the times. Um, that's one of the things I'll say with all of these bands here. No one was doing what they were doing at the time when they did it. And that's progressive in the aspect of what it is. They They came up with a complex idea of what they wanted to be and filtered it into the music and became that. And yeah, even though some of that stuff ultimately moved into the popular realm, nobody sounded like these bands. You can't yeah. go out and find people that copied and did this. And as far as like uh, my audience uh, of all these bands we're talking about today, uh, the one that I have the hardest time convincing people on is Super Tramp. Uh, if, yeah. if you've got it stuck in your mind that they are a pop band, uh, there's nothing I can do to convince you otherwise. Seriously, I mean, it's a real sticking point for some people, and uh, they're, they're just—they've got the Breakfast in America blinders on. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is true. Well, I, I don't want to say I have blinders on, but I always thought that crime—I never saw him as a prog band. I thought I just saw him as just a rock band, a mm -hmm. smart rock band, because I could see Crime of the Century basically to me sound. Uh, let me say this. Breakfast in America to me sounds like the follow up to Crime of the Century because you've got the same type of songs on there. Everything's catchy for the most part. Yeah, there might be a couple of tracks that are deeper, not as accessible. But Crime of the Century has some great singles on it that mm -hmm. totally would match up with Breakfast in America. It's not that much different. Not that much different. But you and don't I think there's like a, a grandioseness and a majesticness yeah. and an intricate and layered approach on Crime of the Century that we don't really get on Breakfast in America? Yeah. I don't see that. No? No. I do. <laughs> see, to me, I, 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 I don't I, see it. I, that's why I'm here. I don't know yeah. what to, I don't want to classify yeah. Super Tramp. I, I look at them as classic rock to some degree. They don't play Super Tramp around here anymore. Yeah. But you, they, they put out such great, catchy songs. You know, yeah, you know they're and an album like this, which has elements of jazz rock on it too. Yeah. See that whole kind of... animal. Yeah, that's a great album. Yeah. Well, and David Gilmore too. Yes. Hey, there we go. Yeah, some too. things never change, you know. And of course, this is without Roger Hodgson's on it. But this to me is where they started to go back to that. Or what if somebody was saying, Are they prog? I feel like this is they started to get back into that, the more experimental stuff on it and and not the pop stuff from uh breakfast in america and you know earlier things but for me i don't know i just I've don't think albums and i've never felt that they were related in the way that you're describing i want to go dar to me that's like part one I and know. part two i want to go it's back like... and listen to this in tandem with it to find out but to me these were night and day different albums. no i see it like candio i see it like the really? first cars album candio yes that's the way i look at it because <laughs> they have a similar tonality even though I know they're different engineers. Once I, I think it's more like the first album in Panorama. Okay. We all, this goes to show you, ladies and gentlemen, that we all hear things differently. Completely. It is crazy how two people, four people, however many can hear a song, hear a band, and we all take it in differently. We all process it differently. And then what comes out of it. And that's the beauty of music. Yeah. 
Yeah, it really is. Well said. And I sometimes wonder too, you know, we've we've mentioned it a few times, this whole idea of what is art rock. Is mm-hmm. art rock really just a tag that we're putting on these bands who kind of don't really they're 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 pop, but it's a little bit too intricate for straight pop. I mean, Tensi yeah. is the perfect example here. That this is the perfect work, example. Working right? Right? music that's very artful. But mm-hmm. like when you really listen to Ten CC, it's not that doesn't sound like Yes or Genesis or King Crimson or any of this kind of it's stuff. Not prog, it, it's not prog. It doesn't sound rock. like Super Tramp, and it doesn't sound like XTC, and it doesn't sound like Roxy music. So what the hell is it? It's just Ten CC, right? It's yeah. art for art's sake, man. Is what it is. Exactly. Yeah, I don't know where I would classify Ten CC. They to- it totally baffles me, and I think there must just be a separate category called Ten CC <laughs> in which they fit in it. I don't know. They were on the second Mandela Band album, all four of them. So that's pretty prog. Yeah. I, mean, I, I don't, think I don't anybody, hear any prog in there, though. I don't think anybody would prog. doubt, and, and Brendan kind of talked about this a, a few minutes ago, prog music has to have that complexity in the songwriting and the ranging. Mm-hmm. Those 10 CC albums are not your basic standard rock or pop formula mm-hmm. arrangements. They're not. They're no, very no. intricate, but the way it's presented and with the vocal harmonies and melodies, it's very easy on the ears. But you could make an argument, I think, that 10 CC is just as progressive as a Yes or a King Crimson is because of those qualities, right? Now, here's one, Pete Pardo, that pops up all the time with my people, and it's been a hot button issue on Twitter for a few years. What to make Al Stewart? There's some uh, people out there that are absolutely convinced that Al Stewart is prog. <laughs> prog adjacent, not, maybe. Prog. Yeah, prog is really adjacent. And uh, we love Al Stewart, but, uh, he, you know, progressive pop is about as far as I would personally go. Yeah. I get progressive it. pop. Yes. Mm-hmm. You like that one? I like yeah, that. Creating all kinds of new genres here. <laughs> but art rock. So well, what, you could art, if you guys rock, think that okay, if you think that Super Tramp is progressive, I would agree. Okay, I'll give it that they're maybe prog adjacent progressive pop. Yeah. Okay. Now you're getting into that. You know, I that mean, it's it's like thinking area. man's it's thinking man's rock, thinking yeah. man's pop. Yeah. So like progressive yeah. pop. I'll give you that. Yeah. Oh, how about, what a great how about traffic, right? Yeah. Great record. <laughs> there's progressive elements it's not yeah. prog as you know it no one's gonna you know confuse this for a new genesis album but it's it's you know there's prog elements in there so it's right in that gray area that i've found over the years i'm really enjoying those bands that people debate about and argue about and are they prog are they not prog mm-hmm. at the end of the day the fact that you're arguing about it means that their music is interesting enough or has it's enough progressive the- elements that it sparks the conversation. There's clearly something there. Exactly. So I find myself living for these bands. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, that really- was that was the reason, Scott, to do an episode like this, because <laughs> yeah, this, this has been talked about to death over the years about yeah. are they or aren't they? And, and the, the traffic uh, idea is great. We did a whole episode on In the Proxy on that particular album. Yeah. And so many people were comments like, why are they talking about traffic on a prog show? It's like, well, because there's an Cause- Prog elements. That is. Music, right? Well, traffic was on another level. Anytime yes. you have Steve Winwood involved, you're talking a different animal. Mm-hmm. Even though he went wimp and sold out. Uh, no. No. Not, well, like, someone no. brought that up <laughs> the other day. How do you classify that? Yeah. Bebop the no other one. But to me, it's it, where these bands are pop, but they, the vocal or something in it is a little off. It's not the way that you would expect it to just fall on line. And so it's that difference, which makes it interesting. And to me, it's one of the key first factors of something that is prog. It's, you know, it has to be interesting, make you think whether we're talking about the complexity of the music or the the storyline that's happening or whatever it might be in it. The first thing that leads in is that interest. And so when some of these early bands the way that they would sing a line different than in the melody than what you might expect it to be and 10 cc for me is a a band that did that in spades where clearly it was pomp but it was different something was off in it making it unique and i think again that's why we were all saying 10 cc is its own genre there's there's nobody like that but in doing that that for me is when i start to quantify something as art rock 
Yeah. Now, it's being done for a purpose, a conceptual idea. It's sung in a certain style to emulate or emote something. And it's not what would be expected. And if you know all of that, you can get behind it and enjoy it and love it and everything. But if it were just on the radio, you just played it for somebody, somebody would go, why is the guy doing that? Why are they singing like that? That's weird. You might be just describing this band, right? Who's that? <laughs> oh, Sparks. Yeah. Ah, Sparks. Yes. Yeah. That's a band I can't get into. Really? I, you really? know, I, I probably haven't hit the right record that will be the gateway for me. Oh, and then, of course, yeah. I'll explode. They're you an know. acquired taste. I mean, that's yeah. probably the peak right there. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. I'll well, look for that album. So good. You yeah. know, one thing we haven't touched upon in the whole 10 CC uh, part of this discussion just kind of hits it home. You know, you listen to their biggest hit, I'm Not in Love, right? Mm -hmm. That is a wonderful creation of all that you can utilize in the studio to make otherworldly sounds and a lot of these bands were able to do that i mean you look at we go back to crime of the century yeah ken scott and the band did some amazing things in the studio to get those kind of sumptuous sounds mm -hmm. 10cc did the same thing they were yeah. masters in the studio and that's why kind of like yeah. even like um you talk about queen right you know like bohemian rhapsody was just such this amazing yeah creation in the studio to use everything possible to get these kind of sounds that we'd never heard before oh is so now is bohemian rhapsody prog too well that's what i was gonna say so is queen that's pretty prog, progressive rock or pop i've always thought of queen as progressive prog, pop prog, pop? Pog. yeah see well you know what the, i was gonna say you mentioned 10 cc and then the studio but don't forget they own their own studio eric stewart was an engineer they had all the time they yep. wanted to go and make these creations they had a situation that most bands don't have yeah. so they could just yep. go and experiment jeff lynn and yeah. elo it's the same thing right i think if we look at a lot of these bands it's it's the time they had in the studios to do that exploration and the ability whatever label or you know who they were working with that allowed for that yeah. exploration and when bands don't have that they're forced into the studio and they only have a certain amount of time and they have to deliver a record on schedule due to a record label release you know they're forced and they simplify and they're going to churn something out but if you can experiment and a lot of these bands could do that. Yeah, and, and you know, you're right. You're producer. talking about a, a time in music history where, let's remember the first 16 track uh, studio in operation in London came online in 1972. You know, so now all of a sudden bands had a lot of freedom, not just from the technological aspect of uh, synthesizers and, you know, Moogs and Mellotrons and all kinds of cool stuff like that. But now they actually had some tracks to play with. You know, they didn't have to George Martin bounce stuff back and forth, left and right. They could actually get really experimental, lay down you know, multiple tracks and really do some cool, interesting things making the studio like a another member of the band almost making mm -hmm. that producer whether it's roy thomas baker or yeah. uh, eddie offered they're basically like a another member of the band yeah. for a little while and that's that's a big part that harry means. brown yeah 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 harry brown right yeah. but what do you look at uh, this is just popped into my head you mentioned all the technology and you know of course the beatles were very successful could sell records emi just said hey have at it right you know so they didn't have that kind of pressure like other people did but that 16 track opened everything yeah. up for everybody that you wouldn't have to spend all that much time in the studio though a lot of you know depending on your pedigree and how much how many records you sold it all depends for different people Certainly. but that opened things up and was able to uh, allow people to be way more creative oh yeah to some degree. unless you've got a george martin you know, if you're trying to add all these different layers and all this tracking and all this overdubbing and you've only got eight tracks, it's going to end up showing. <laughs> you're going to, and and it, it sounds like it. Right. Uh, so yeah, I'll, unless you had a big budget back then, you were going to sound like you had a small budget. Nowadays, bands with, you know, band, uh, all their capabilities to yeah. get into, you know, GarageBand and Pro Tools and all these different softwares. It's just hard to believe that there were actual restrictions to how many tracks you could lay down that really did affect the music industry a lot. And once you got into the 70s, the floodgates opened up and bands mm -hmm. could just experiment 
and not just prog bands, all these other bands like we're talking about today could experiment, expand out, try some different things. That 10 CC track that you mentioned, Pete, is actually a good call because uh, not only was that the band's biggest hit, but it was uh, in the U.S. anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's it's arguably their proggiest track with the way yeah. they laid that everything down in the studio, and it just sounds so beautiful and pristine and beautiful. perfect. Uh, just an amazing, amazing track. Because how many and, people, when they heard, maybe first heard, or even like the hundredth time they heard, "I'm not in love," and you listen to those parts in there, you think, "Oh, that's got to be some kind of weird, like backwards Mellotron or keyboard." It's like it's no. It's like how many what fifty vocal tracks all edited together, and they all had a run the faders to get it to do yeah, what it needed yeah. to do it's like right no computers to do it they had to do it themselves <laughs> right exactly unbelievable it just goes to bring up to to mind too like a lot of these bands we're talking about today like the first album or two still kind of figuring it out but like as scott said once they're all of a sudden getting maybe a little extra money from the record label getting a good producer i mean xtc is a perfect example those first couple albums are very much in this kind of like post-punk style but still yeah, very complex from a yeah. writing and arranging perspective but they're still kind of rock with todd Lundgren yeah. and, and all these yeah. other producers and having more time in the studio and more money and all of a sudden whoa is that the same band it's yeah. like well yeah but it's just now they've got all the resources behind them to make out exactly we can actually book an orchestra for a few days uh, right. which bankrupt the band and led to uh, Dave Gregory's exit or something as simple as we can buy an actual Mellotron, you know, and uh, yeah. they started using that in their records. Uh, and the reason they didn't earlier is they, they couldn't afford one. <laughs> it's just that simple. So yeah. you know, these bands evolved sometimes, uh, you know, because it was their creative muse, but a lot of times it was, it was just the reality of the situation. You know, the label wants a record and they want it now. So <laughs> We'll do, we'll do what we need to do to get it out. But uh, uh, XTC, uh, you know, you mentioned the great drums and wires. And I wanted to ask you something, Grant, if you knew about this one here. Uh, 1979, my friend. Uh, of course, everybody knows this album. So great, Virgin, the album cover, one of my all-time favorite albums. But Virgin dropped this in 1979 also. Uh, Similar album cover, bands called Interview, albums called Big Oceans, mm -hmm. very similar sound. Uh, I believe this was the very first production job Colin Thurston ever did, who would go on to become super famous producing Duran Duran, mm -hmm. you know, a million other guys. But uh, very, very similar sound, man. Uh, have you ever heard this band? They're well, from, I've never heard I think it. They're from Long Island, Pete. Oh, no, never heard of them. Well, I've never seen it before interview very interview. cool very similar sound to xtc but you know labels were just basically signing anybody and everybody that had uh something different going on at that time so very exciting time yeah you had bands like the stranglers doing progressive -y yeah. things and you know the lines were really getting blurry uh punk had really okay. changed everything prog was kind of on its deathbed there for a little while. The whole punk thing and the whole disco thing shaked up the music industry. But, you know, prog prevailed, man. And bands like uh, Per Ubu and uh, uh, The Stranglers and even a lot of so-called punk bands like The Damned still doing sidelong epics and stuff. I mean, so prog had a way of infiltrating. Uh, Aerosmith well, used the Mellotron things. on Dream On, you know, it, it was everywhere. You know, probably such a thing, even even some of those punk bands, I, I've heard the various singers and members say they're fans of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Just mm -hmm. because they were out playing something entirely different didn't mean they weren't fans of that. And they brought some of those aspects into what they were doing. And Prague at that time, it really just went underground. I, it, yeah. You know, the, the big bands weren't, you know, selling and, and banking and, and doing the stuff that they were doing. But those members didn't go away. They formed all these other little subgroups. It's like UK, you know, with John Wetton and Eddie Jobson and Eddie Jobson, who's, um, you know, was in Roxy Music briefly. Mm -hmm. um, they just all did these other things until it started to come back, you know, in the early 80s when the punk was dying off and nobody quite knew what to do. And that's where the new wave and the post-punk and stuff started to come in. And they said, that shit's really easy. We can play. You know what it is, Brendan? Yeah. It's a demographic echo. If you yeah. look at like uh, the demographic tree for the Soviet Union, you can see this huge dent right. World War II because uh -huh. everybody died. 
20, 25 <laughs> years later, there's another dent. Uh -huh. There's a demographic echo. We have a demographic echo with Prague where the kids of the, you know, those people that were listening to Prague in the seventies, uh, we had a bump in the nineties. That mm -hmm. was where the third wave started. It yeah. was that demographic bump. And we're seeing it again. This is the second demographic echo. This is the Prague echo happening. So yeah, we're capitalizing on it. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm excited about it. Happens. It seems like about, if you look at, at the genres and stuff and they will die off and about 20 years later, it's all cool again. There you go. There what you goes go. Brown comes you around. The dance records. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, Prague tried to do it again in the early 80s, but other than in the UK, it really wasn't happening anywhere else, unfortunately. Right, right. So it took like in the early 90s, it started happening everywhere because, you know, Scandinavia all of a sudden was like, hey, we want to get in on this. Uh, mm -hmm. You had all these bands from Sweden popping up and then the US bands. So and then all this, all these neo prog bands in the UK. So and, and it's happening once again, which is right. it really is. And, right. you know, it's not just relegated to these underground bands, right? You've got Coldplay doing epic tracks. You've got, uh, you know, bigger yeah, bands like uh, Muse. Wires, they want a 21 minute track yep. released just called Play. Yeah. Where he took that whole idea of the prog that you want to play every instrument and sell all in one take could he do it you know yep. food fighters dave Grohl. they're not he's not prog well, right or time. is he yeah, or is he, 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 is he the decemberist just dropped the 19 minute track uh uh, I got a brand new album coming out. So, you know, Prague's tentacles are everywhere. So it is no surprise that, uh, you know, we saw it in some of those bands that we talked about. So, you know, is Super Tramp or ELO or, or any of those bands, capital P Prague? Absolutely not. But when you look at how big Prague rock was in the early 70s, the millions and millions and millions of copies of records that were sold and the hundreds of thousands of people that were going to see these bands live, should it surprise anyone that there would be, you know, some influence spreading out in every direction? Absolutely. There's an electric sitar solo in Cat's Cradle by Harry Chapin. Of course, Prague was everywhere, man. Its tentacles went everywhere. It absolutely did. And you know, we uh, haven't even talked, we haven't even talked about it, but although it was mentioned a couple minutes ago, I mean, new wave, when you think about mm -hmm. it which is this kind of weird offshoot from punk and pop. And mm -hmm. do you guys ever hear like a little bit of prog and like Blondie or the cars? And because yeah. mm -hmm. they had some odd time signatures Devo, in what they were doing. Yes. Yes. Yeah. For sure. and, right, yeah. But I don't hear any prog in it. I don't. You're listening to the wrong Devo oh, records, man. Yeah. Listen to this one. Duty now. I got people. that. It's oh, there's prog all over this, and it's produced by Ken I think Scott, Scott hears prog in everything, that's ladies and gentlemen. That's I'm no offense, but it's he that's kind of true. prog he in Firefall, damn it. <laughs> I know there's prog in here. No way. <laughs> uh, well, the is right. Oh, no, a couple of past. I mean, we talked about you know Roxy music and 10 CC, and we mentioned uh, um, uh. Super Tramp and Bebop, Bebop Deluxe and, oh, yeah. and Utopia. Yeah. I mean, there's ele there's like these new wavy elements in all of those albums, by the right. way. Right. Well, so, Adventures in Utopia, in very kind of new wavy. Yeah. 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 Spots for sure. Talking heads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I don't mean, forget you get new wave in Rush, ladies and gentlemen. They love listening, you know, the police influence. Mm -hmm. You listen to Getty in those old interviews. They love all that stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. Big yeah. influence on Rush. Yep. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to report that there are actual bands selling actual records today still, you know, being influenced by Prague, even though, you know, Prague will never be what it was back in the 70s. But if you want to tell me that uh, Muse is not a Prague band, uh, I got news for you. They are a Prague band. Absolutely, they are. Uh, Coheed and Cambria, The Deer Hunter, Mars Volta. There's a lot of bands doing really, really well that are most certainly Prague uh, Opeth sells a whole bunch of records. They got a big following. Well, they're definitely prog. Prog is alive and well, ladies and gentlemen. But all How? the bands you're listening are metal bands. And prog has moved out of what was originally the idea of prog, which was straight ahead, not straight ahead, but I mean, it was rock. And now it's like there's progressive metal and of course still progressive rock, but there's all these different sort of subcategories. And it's metal. Yeah. Thing, yeah. Is that prog 
is still around. Even when people don't want to acknowledge that it's prog, there's so many bands out there doing the stuff, keeping it alive. Yeah. You know, here, here, there most certainly are. And that's what keeps my channel going. Yeah. Absolutely. There's <laughs> tons of bands out there. It's unbelievable. Uh, I just got a brand new record in today, Brandon. And I'm going to, you know, uh, Emerald City Council. How cool is this? It's the nephew. Cool Carrie Lickren from Kansas's nephew. What? And uh, this cat on drums, Noah Hungate. And I ring a bell. Yeah, it's David a, Hungate's David son. Hungate's son, Emerald City Council. Emerald very City Council. clever. Very cool. Prague all the way. If you like Kansas. And I've got like three things yeah. I've got to look up here. I'm just going to have to watch the video back just to be able to get all the things that I need to check out. I um, love supporting new Prague. I okay. love talking about the old stuff, but there's mm -hmm. so much great new stuff out there, Pete Pardo. And he's like, it. where in the world is this conversation gone? I have no control over this panel at all. Well, so, I'll tell uh, you, I I'm just going to bring it up now because I just realized that it's staring me in the face for the, the whole hour. We haven't even mentioned Steely Dan. And yeah. So we got a couple uh, hours. I was surprised uh, it wasn't on the list. Well, that's there's another... I mean that's a that's category. A, historically nobody knows how to classify what yeah. the hell is Steely Dan other than Steely Dan, right? Is it I mean, like jazz, rock, jazz pop? pop. Is, it rock? is it funk? Yeah. I, I don't know. They're jazz, jazz rock. rock that's pop. right. <laughs> but the studio again, this comes back to studio. Yep. What they did in the studio to me elevates it far beyond any kind of pop music. Yeah. Um, the art form of what they figured out how to do in the studio takes it into that level. If we want to call it Prague, it could be called Prague. Yeah. And I think it's that artfulness, that smartness, that intelligence, what do you want to call it? Where when they're putting this stuff together, it's done in a very unique, regardless of how complex it is. It's that artful way of thinking about it, that very thoughtful method to me that begins to get things into Prague. Who am I looking at? A bunch of prog rockers right That's there. That's the uh, pretzel logic. for pretzel logic. Oh, <laughs> wow. Yes. When you opened that, that's funny. That could be the guys from Dream Theater today. <laughs> or it could be the damn Allman Brothers, for God's sake. Yeah, I don't that know. Too. Yeah, exactly. Could be. It could it be. It was the era. But I'll tell you, that guy on the cover the album is really on, uh, the head rock. Peanuts and whatnot. Oh, this guy. Yeah. I'd grown up in New York and my, you know, I grew up in, in the city and my had my parents lived in the city. We used to see a guy like that on every street corner in the wintertime with, with yeah. the pretzels yeah. and the chestnuts. And Those yeah. were the days. That was such a, that's such a New York city. Oh, scene. absolutely. Yeah. I have to get my, my chestnuts when the, when the wintertime rolls around, it's just, uh, yeah, you work in the city, you know, you, they, those yeah, guys, yeah, are, right. they're, they're, still there. they're still there. They just don't quite look like that in the car. No, no, they look much nicer now. <laughs> So did so we? Is, well, yeah. so is Steely Dan prog because look at it: time yeah. signatures, very complex music, mm -hmm. lyrics, vocals. I think it checks all the boxes. Yeah. But I'm just curious: what makes it not prog? What makes it not prog? Right I guess there. is that people know their hits and they had songs on the radio, so there's yeah. an expectation that that's all they are. But you know, I. If we're going to put any of those jazz rock bands into the prog basket, if we're putting Mahu Vishnu Orchestra, and if we're putting Return to Forever, and if we're putting any of those bands in there, why not put Steely Dan in there too? They're jazz rock uh, well, primarily, I guess, but uh, there's so much more than that. They're just amazing. Yeah. And if any band besides Velvet Underground screams New York louder than Steely Dan, I want to know what name that band is. Oh, maybe Ramones, I guess. But I mean, <laughs> yes, I hear right. Ramones. It was New York. He really did as a solo artist screams New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's Steely Dan. Well, I'll put them in um, everything, but uh, and yeah. and they are everything, right? So, yeah, yeah. But you know, you got lots of bands that fit. Yeah, into that are they or aren't they category? Nobody mentioned Chicago. You know, that's another one that it's early album, wow. right? those yeah. early albums, those first seven, man, that sounds like Prague to me. It sounds like Prague to me, yeah. but with the, but it's Prague everything that's on it, it takes it out of it. it. It's, it's too jazzy for me. So even if it's Prague, I, when I hear it, I don't hear Prague in it. I hear the horns. I hear the jazz influences of it. 
I don't know. Look, look at those arrangements, what... those complicated arrangements, and because yeah. oh. we could say the same thing about Colosseum, right? Colosseum nucleus. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, now I consider that frog though. Yeah, I think we're just digging a bigger hole here is what yeah, we're we are, doing. Yeah, because now we're mentioning so, every band out there, right? So, right, right, yeah, right. But that's what I, you know, Pete, that's what I do, man. If if I like it, it's probably Prague. Right, man? Isn't that what you said earlier? If you, <laughs> right, right, right. Beach Prague Boy Smile Prague. album, what would that be? Prague? Yeah, you see? Yeah. Well, that's yeah, early man. 1967. Why not? Because that's out there. Yeah. Is that Prague or not? You know, there's a lot I, of people that point to it art rock. Brian Wilson as one of the originators of Prague. They look. I at, would agree. Um, I would know, agree. They look at his work. Surfs in the up. Studio. Look at the that, track. That surfs sounds, up. If that's not Prague, I don't know what is. Yeah, so, it's a big tent. A boat on these bands. How, like, how do we? Yeah. How do we close this? Coming to a conclusion of what we think these artists are. Like, what? I don't ELO? think we can. Well, I say ELO is pop. So where do you guys stand? I say that none of these albums I'd, or bands is Tales from Topographic Ocean, so it's not 100%. Prog. That's right. It's not Prague. It doesn't sound there like There you yes. go, Pete. Okay. So are, are they... It's been that we kind of vote. week here. I got to throw that out there. <laughs> okay. Because I think... you. So, Brett, you don't think ELO is... You think it has any... You have, it doesn't have prog elements? No, no, I'm not saying it doesn't have prog elements. I'm saying, um, there, yeah, there's plenty of complexity. There's there's plenty mm -hmm. of intricacy in what they're doing. Absolutely. I, they figured out a way to make a three-minute song, even though it's prog. But what I'm saying is the overall arcing, the, the impression of what, what that song, album, band is, to me, they're a pop band. But then I again... Don't, I don't classify them as prog. I would not listen to elo to me is not like uh p parter says not yes it's not deep um but uh, yes is well, almost like prog pop to some degree yes how i mean they not, could not write until, catchy uh, songs great. but are in the prog vein that's true <laughs> simon and garfunkel was a major influence for <laughs> yes and we didn't even get into any of the pop you know the pump stuff how about that's, angel the first two prog out uh, the first yeah, two angel are albums are prog yeah That's those so are tough. so great so therein lies the way we're going to conclude this episode i think we can agree that every one of these bands we've talked about today have at least one or two or three prog albums but yes that doesn't make them a prog band yeah they might have elements like we all have a check a prog checklist like brandon was saying strange time signatures check uh thematically interesting or good storytelling check uh you know various instrumentation you know you gotta have a mini moog and a synth, long you know, song a check. Yeah. well you know uh, what one check box i'm going to quote the the great Rand kelly if it's uh, got mellotron on it it's probably prog <laughs> that's right that's right tell leonard skinner that I yeah know, right <laughs> tell, tell, Mad tell madonna that right yeah right right all right but so we can't check every box all the time. There's only right. a handful of bands that actually will fulfill the checklist. So yeah. I figure if you get one or two checked off, you're close enough. Come on. You're part of the prog team. <laughs> Welcome. Come join the family. <laughs> That's right. All a warm embrace. <laughs> right. So I don't know if we've solved anything with this episode, but I will say it's been a blast chatting. But it's been fun. About this, right? So uh, <laughs> what it's all about, oh right? We're, we're not trying to yeah. save the world. We're just trying to uh, spur up some great conversation about some, quite frankly, some really great bands and albums here. That's what we talked about today. And that's what it's all about. That's what we do. So for right. those of you watching, uh, if you have an answer to this whole question, are these bands Prague? Are they art rock? Or are they something else completely? Prague adjacent. <laughs> Prog adjacent. Maybe that's Prog like, adjacent. That's, that's right, what was the other category? Uh, prog yes. pop. Yeah, prog pop. pop. Right. So you guys can use pop. those too. <laughs> I think the next time I review a brand new album by a band that fits into this category, I'm going to put prog adjacent or prog yeah. pop or something like that. Let's see I if anybody have to. remembers right. this. So. Let's so do before it. we go, I do want to have uh, everybody here uh, plug their own channels. Uh, we'll go Brendan, Scott, and Grant. So Brendan, you want to plug right. what's going on over on your channel? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, if you guys don't know my channel, come on over. You can find me on YouTube just under my name, Brendan Snyder. I uh, do all kinds of different stuff. I go to record stores, film experience videos, uh, do discussion topics with record store owners, top 10 reviews, um, album reviews. So 
yeah, come on over, check it out. Uh, there's always something new. I've got uh, new music finds every Wednesday, and then I've got music news on Fridays and what just dropped on Saturdays. So lots of great stuff. And if you like box sets, he's oh yeah, <laughs> I've got tons of box set videos. Lots on. Of box set. As you can see uh, above him there on top of the shelf. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. You need a few more. Probably. Just a few. Just a few. Yeah, so, I've got over 350 now. So holy mackerel. Yeah. Yeah. That's why he bought that new house. Come on. Yeah. yeah. I had to buy the house. Where else was I going to You can't get rid of anything. No, no, I don't. I, I right, keep that's it. that's good. Awesome. Get a new house. Yeah. <laughs> the curse is real, people. Scott, the curse is real. It is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. So let me tell you something, boys and girls. <laughs> it's going to be an exciting week on the Prague Corner. Uh, I am so excited. Yeah, record store day is 420. It is Saturday. So once all you cats and kittens get back into your homes, tune into the Prague Corner at 1 p.m. Eastern where New Jersey's greatest Prague band are reuniting for the reissue of their one and only 1976 classic. For you, the old women, it's being reissued on Dies Case Plus Cabell. Yeah, the same people that brought you the Boo Boo reissue and uh, Cheval Fu and uh, Alpha Centauri. But this one, I'm so excited. The first time it's going to be available on vinyl for 48 years. Mirth Rander will be on my channel answering your questions, talking about this record. And uh, so we're going to have a lot of fun. So again, that's a Saturday, 420, 1 o'clock Eastern with Mirth Rander on the Prague Corner. It's going to be awesome, Pete. Very cool. Such a great, yeah. album. great album. I love that. I'm excited. I love them. You know I love them. Yeah, it's an old classic. It's a great one. Oh, yeah. It was long lost undiscovered gems from that time period that uh if you haven't heard it you need to listen to that and i'm sorry a lot of times when they tell you it's the hidden gem from the 70s you just got to hear and then you listen to it you're like i don't get it you'll get it with this one yeah that's one of them that, yeah. that's kind of like cathedral and those yes the the Earth I love that. Cathedral. cathedral that cathedral album is one of my favorite prog albums of all it's time this earth renders right up there with cathedral right up there. i'll have to check that out yes. england garden shed there's like the uh, of those yeah those, those little yes. gems. yeah yeah wasn't cathedral from like indiana or illinois or something they were like in the midwest i think weren't they uh, this cathedral was from New York. Yeah, they were from Long Island, actually. Yeah. Yeah. God, maybe I'm thinking of a different record. There's, There's a couple of cathedrals out there. Yeah, there are. There's a doom yeah. band from the UK. It's not them. Yeah. All right. Well, there you go. Stained Glass Stories is amazing. That's it. Stained Glass Stories. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's great. Amazing. Yeah. Great. Grant, All right. On the Contrarians, uh, we're going to be premiering. Wow. When we're recording this on Saturday the 13th at 7, we're, Martin will be there. We'll all be there. Have a great, great panel. We'll be talking bands that get better, better, and better with each record. So that's going to be a great discussion. Sunday on my channel, I'm doing a listening party, and we're going to look play uh, two hours of just L.A. bands. So oh. there might be some metal. There might be some punk. There might be all kinds of stuff. But then as far as beyond that, I don't know. We may have a, a live chat in the Contrarians on Wednesday, but I don't know. Jamie Laszlo's on those, and he had a loss in his family. And I don't know if we're going to have a live chat on Wednesday or not. You just have to play it by ear and see if we have it. So we're all thinking about Jamie and uh, hope he's doing okay. So uh, absolutely, that's what's coming up pretty much. But there's stuff coming out daily on my channel and the Contrarians. So. Always always yeah. grant hold up that firefall cd you got there oh so yeah and i will be uh ranking the albums together once again uh probably sometime in early may and uh, we're going to be based on popular demand we're going to rank the albums of firefall because that's how oh. we do it on sot we jump from prog to thrash to death metal to pop to country rock to fusion and everything in between so and and right. roadmaster that, that'll be right after that as well so we've got firefall and roadmaster holy crap that's a I'm good band, on right? it. they're yeah. really good Holy crap, Pete. I've been playing, not this one. I, I just got this. So I haven't played it yet, but the first, the, the second and third album. Oh, yes. Oh my God. Those are how, so good. How those did so good. I never hear about those guys? I never heard of this band either. So I, I, I only found them through Rock Candy. Yeah. Oh, I love Rock Candy. God, you would even like them. They're kind of like Sticks, early Ario Speedwagon, maybe a little. And angel. there's some prog on there too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's probably I, I am where are the, where are those guys from? Yeah, Indiana, I believe. Indiana. 
yeah. Indiana. Okay. I never heard of him before. Four four albums. Four albums. Yeah. yeah. Very good stuff. Very good stuff. And Todd Runger <laughs> produced the first record. And really? Todd Runger produced the first one. There you go. <laughs> Got here. No, I'm I can hardly wait to discuss it. <clears throat> yes, we'll we'll wait. It's coming up. So that well, that's coming God, up. That's right gonna now. be so good. In uh in May. Uh, we've got coming up here on the channel. So uh, tomorrow, ranking the albums, Count Rathus and I will be ranking the albums of the great German thrash legends, Destruction. That's coming up tomorrow. We've got uh, the Hudson Valley. It's it's thrash week on the channel, folks. So we've got the Hudson Valley Squares. We're going to be taking a look at the uh, California thrash scene of the 80s and the German thrash scene. So it's Megadeth, Metallica, Testament, and Slayer going up against Destruction, Creator, Tankard, and Sodom. Who did it better in the 80s and who's doing it better today? Uh, Martin Popoff and I will also be ranking the albums of all the 80s records from the big four of Thrash, Anthrax, Metallica, Megadeth, and Slayer. That's coming up on Friday. I'll also be doing uh, the next show in my series of albums for newbies. I will be doing the 10 Thrash albums that every new newbie needs to own. So it's Thrash Everything this week. And then that's a great series, by the way, Pete. I hate to interrupt yeah. you, but I am I am going to be stealing that. Okay, I, I, okay. a lot of people like... have. So yeah, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, what else is happening here on the channel? Ranking the albums next week will be uh, Rick Labonte and myself a top ten albums of Savoy Brown. We've got Steve Hillage coming the week after that. And then Scott and I will be. Do I mean, uh, Grant and I will be doing our stuff. Scott and I and Ken Golden yeah. will also be doing the ten our ten favorite Mellotron albums of all time. That's coming up to. There's a ton of shit happening here on Sea Tranquility, folks. So uh, <laughs> please up. check out all these channels. Hit that subscribe button and give everybody your love. And uh, we'll see you soon here with more stuff. Visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on YouTube all together all the damn time. For Brendan Snyder, Scott Laid, and Grant Arthur, I am Pete Pardo. Thanks for watching this all-star collaboration <laughs> here. There'll be more of them. Until next <laughs> yeah. time, I'm Pete Pardo. Have a good one, everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thanks, guys.